think yesterday there was mention of some countries that have begun to make some strides into creating a conducive environment. And one of the countries that was mentioned was Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is one of the countries that uh, decided to approach some of us and say they've built a considerable history uh, and experience in dealing with official development aid, but they have no idea how to deal with philanthropy. And so they were the first to write a strategy on how to engage philanthropy. Uh, the Southern community also through the Southern Africa Trust, and I'm sure at some point the CEO might refer to it, has also approached some of the uh, uh, colleagues here to develop what they call their resource mobilization framework for the region, which is a key component uh, on philanthropy. And I think that if you did a scan of the countries across the continent that have developed something around that nature, there are very few. So only Mauritius has a specific law that is referred to as the Foundation Act. There is no other country that is got that. And so we, we want to use this session to, to understand the trends, the constraints, but also the opportunities that are provided currently and what we can do about that going forward. And so we'll start with the, uh, Brian Kagoro, uh, who is going to try and paint a picture of what the continent looks like. Yeah, he has the benefits uh, at some point to do a continental study around the policy and legal framework. Uh, and then we we'll go into country specifics and some thematic uh, specifics. Because the legislation and the policy environment really cut across countries, but it also affects specific uh, interests and sectors within the public sector. Um, I think the challenge, the, let me start off with the with things that you know. So, uh, I was involved in the Rwanda process with uh, Moyo and uh, the Africa and Southern Africa processes to some extent. The, there are about five approaches to regulation. Uh, the one is the legalistic approach, which purely posits uh, the function of law to define the role, uh, the parameters, or the controls of uh, philanthropy. And this has tended to take certain nuances. The first nuance is that of a laundromat or a waste management system. Basically, the state has not been uh, as effective in doing development that is inclusive, that creates jobs. So it finds an adjunct called philanthropy, or what is called the uh, acceptable charity to do its uh, laundry by taking care of those poor who have fallen through the cracks because most of the states after structural adjustment have no social policy. So philanthropy becomes the safety net uh, expansion system. The, so the notion of regulation there goes to something, a nebulous concept called public benefit. And I kept asking my friend Dr. Marisa, uh, uh, what does that mean? The second is the incentivized do good -ism. This notion that you can have uh, uh, what someone has called uh, rich sugar daddies and do, uh, sugar monies to contribute to um, uh, uh, saving the poor. Uh, and in order to get them to do this, they are given tax exemptions or they campaign for tax exemptions. So part of the goodness of capital is this ability to do um, extraordinary acts for poor people. The third is regulation has tended to take a, an old approach to supervision and surveillance, which is the state security supervision. So anything, the regulation is not to enable, it is not to expand, it is not. So let me just stop for a moment there and say, colleagues, Part of the problem of regulation, not just of the land road, but regulation generally, especially legal regulation, is that it has been premised on the notion of a state under threat from its own citizens, or a state under threat, or an elite under threat from. So it has tended to take a very narrow approach to um, the state security uh, approach. The, the other has been the, com, what they call the containment of commerciality. Um, in, so we start talking about philanthropic capitalism, they start worrying that some people will use 
philanthropy in order to escape the rigors of market competition. So the regulation is simply intended to control uh, that extension. And then there is a regulation that is quasi-revolutionary uh, regimes begin to talk about enabling subaltern or poor people's voices or disruption of the status quo. This convenient regulation where the state, in order to counter certain interests, creates a space that it calls philanthropic. And then, of course, there's regulation as we're seeing in Rwanda and elsewhere around creation of a common market for philanthropy. The context of regulation must be understood, though. Many of our states are fragile, donor dependent, and right now getting deeper and deeper into debt. The long and short of it is this that regulation has been focused on the money element of philanthropy and no other element, not the psychosocial dimensions, not the uh, economic, by economic I don't mean simply creating entrepreneurs, but economic dimension that creates local assets, general local economic development and so on and so forth. Now, the danger with any analysis of regulation is this, many of our countries, many of our regulatory frameworks are run on memory and not imagination. So because of an experience we've seen elsewhere in Pakistan of United States of America based uh, so-called philanthropies coming in to do the bidding of American foreign policy and therefore being engaged in regime change or spying, it becomes informative of how we, we regulate. But the context of fragility in Africa is also informed by factors such as terrorism. So we're seeing increasingly in Kenya and elsewhere uh, a response to that particular context. And why is that important? Philanthropy is regulated as part of the NGO sector. So, and that is uh, that construction way that is only state, private sector, and others also means that we have reached a limit in terms of it, imagination. Now, friends, I would be remiss if I suggested that that is not also the new regulation approaches are not informed by other positive nuances. The one nuance is that there's a global acceptance, as many of you have said in the last two days, of the fact that uh, you need alternative sources of development uh, finance. Is that, or, oh, that's a lot. I thought it was time out. You need alternative sources of uh, alternative development finance. So part of the regulation now is not about philanthropy in and of itself, but the need of the state and develop other development actors for alternatives to their exhausted model of development and of financing transformation. Herein lies the tragedy. Philanthropies have not invested sufficient time in studying what went wrong with the international NGOs, what went wrong with the other actors who were funding supposedly the poverty bashing or poverty eradication programs over years. And as such, the tendency would be to replicate, sometimes on steroids, mistakes made before. And philanthropies have tended to also go into the style that the, what others have called telescopic charity did before, throwing money at the problem. Um, I call it the model missionary, model mercenary approach. The notion that what is wrong with poor Africans is their dissimilarity to the West. Their dissimilarity to cultures, approaches in the West. Ask the Chinese. Yeah. They'll tell you that no civilization has ever developed if it does not leverage its culture. And part of the regulatory relaxation in Africa has also been focused on the following. Many big philanthropic foundations from the West, when they enter our countries, their first port of call is the same dictator that everyone else is complaining about. So they've become a legitimation or a legitimating factor for local autocracy and repression. Because it does pay for most of their websites. Uh, a selfie with the president of a country, no matter how shoddy their human rights record is, seems to go a long way to demonstrate impact, especially if you let you to go and build black toilets in the village, as though all that Africans must do is eat and go to the toilet. So there has been then a fundamental issue, a fundamental issue. Regulation has not focused on the three sensitive factors. The first one, 
We now know from Japan and China that without technology transfer on an industrial scale, there's not going to be any real meaningful transformation. So philanthropy has painted itself in this corner where it's so focused until recently, and that's why I was quite consoled by some of the proposals that are on the table. It stayed away from high skills development. It stayed away from technology transfer. It steered away. In fact, I used to say to diaspora philanthropists that your greatest contribution to Africa is not money that you send. Many of the policies that are keeping our people impoverished and our states incapable of becoming real meaningful players are made where you sit. So why don't you use your leverage, whether it's in Silicon Valley, in New York, or in Paris, to actually transform those policies? Because the idea that international NGOs, I used to call it the poverty pornography industry, you go and extract a grandmother from a village, take her to the G8, to a, uh, a concert, and let her say, we are poor, we must end unfair trade, actually doesn't cut it anymore. So what philanthropy was not regulated to do is what we were talking about. This meeting of the high-end, future-focused work that is transformative, challenging global power, acting as an intermediator between global power and the continent. That we have not yet conceptualized a role for it. And it seems philanthropy itself has not conceptualized a role. It has conceptualized how to talk to rich people in the north, to give to poor people in the south. But this sometimes feeds three types of imperialism. Knowledge imperialism, right? Which means we all now look to the north as the norms, right? It feeds a form of imperialism which I call cultural imperialism. There are ways in which, and I will learn with this. What we learned in Rwanda, for example, the Rwandans said, you want to help us develop philanthropy strategies. Let's start with our own indigenous, homegrown methods and ways. In fact, that was their first instruction to us. And a lot of philanthropy, a lot of grant making, a lot of the structure is not prepared to do, it, it knows how to consult, but it's not prepared to do homegrown. Finally, Chair, regulation has been constrained by the following factors. Philanthropy that is external has it much easier than philanthropy that is indigenous. The regulation of indigenous philanthropy has tended to treat it as a ghetto or informal sector. So the permanent tagging of informality has been a permanent. Let me sit down before Becky uh, takes me out. So I've, I've, I've known Brian for quite some time. If I don't stand up, there's no way for him to sit down. <laughs> so thank you so much, Brian. I think we will uh, now move to Faith. Uh, Faith has been uh, working in the Kenyan space uh, particularly for civil society and the philanthropic sector for a very long time. And in fact, if there is somebody to give you first hand negotiations around developing uh, a regulator and policy framework for civil society, it is, it is fair. Uh, she spent a whole lot of her time, I think, you know, going back and forth with government. Uh, I think with the last law that uh, was developed for civil society in Kenya. So, over to you, Now, the laws around the world is not contested, but you need an enabling legal environment and that philanthropy is very useful for any society. Um, the global index for legal philanthropy actually has noted that about three quarters, um, actually 77% for the governments around the world have actually come up with laws that support corporate philanthropy. And about two thirds actually have laws that have incentives for individual philanthropy. Now that goes to show that the importance of philanthropy in any country, in most countries around the world, is not disputed. So Kenya is actually um, one of those countries where we have a vast array of laws that actually support philanthropy by individuals and by corporates, um, and, and also uh, different aspects of mobilization of local resources. So one of the key laws that I, I was really glad to have been part of uh, bringing about and lobbying for was the charitable uh, donations regulations, which in many aspects has been touted to be one of the most enabling frameworks for charitable donations anywhere in the world. 
what it provides, things like individuals and corporates can actually deduct the whole 100% donation from their pre-tax income. Now in most countries, usually it's a, it's a small percentage, but it depends actually the whole amount. Um, the other, uh, there are a number of other laws that focus on other types of contributions, not just cash. We also have laws that talk about how you can uh, contribute property. So we have, for example, the uh, Estate Duty Act, which allows people to make requests uh, of their land. Uh, so you can donate in your will, your property, your land, and if, and if it's donated after one year after your death, then the person who is inheriting it will not have to suffer uh, the payment of estate duty. So they will actually be able to receive it without those encumbrances. Um, there are laws that actually allow you to donate securities as long as they are listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. You can actually donate them uh, and you will not suffer, you will not have to pay the capital gains tax, which will make it difficult for you then um, to donate that kind of security. So if you're, if you're transferring it to an NGO or a public benefit organization, it makes it much easier. So there are also laws that allow you to donate goods and equipment. Um, in the, the Value Added Tax Act and the Customs and Excise Act, where tax, those taxes are actually remitted. Uh, the government actually allows you to donate those goods and equipment um, that are necessary for charitable organizations or useful for medical um, purposes without having to suffer the payment of um, value added tax or customs and excess taxes. Um, and then there are actually also a number of laws that encourage the government to set up endowments. Uh, which have enabled the government to actually set up uh, a whole range of endowments. Uh, for example, to do legal aid, the Legal Aid Act uh, has come up with a legal aid fund. And so anybody who contributes time in terms of legal aid can actually get some kind of incentives for doing so. Or um, anybody who contributes money to that fund can actually get some kind of deduction for, having, for doing that. There are endowments for wildlife conservation, and the law actually allows you to donate your land um, for wildlife conservation purposes. Uh, a fund has been set up to uh, provide funding to community initiatives um, that deal with uh, wildlife conservation. And then there are also funds that have been set up you know, for the field of scientific research, um, ICT, um, uh, uh, and micro and small enterprises, but all these are in the public realm. They have been set up by the statutory uh, legal frameworks, and so really they are in the public realm. There's a gap in terms of private philanthropy, private endowments. There are no laws that really encourage people to come up with these private endowments or private uh, foundations that can actually be able to independently uh, finance some of the very important work uh, out there. So those are the main supporting laws. The other kind of fundamentals that are important to uh, recognize uh, is the issue of accountability and trust. Um, a lot of giving is really dependent on that. Uh, Self-regulation in Kenya, especially in the non-profit sector, is a big issue. It really needs to be enhanced for there to be more local philanthropy. Um, then there's the issue of political will, which was mentioned today morning. Um, we have a very enabling law that for the last five or six years has not been com commenced because the government feels that this act is too enabling and it might actually be used by the human rights and advocacy organizations to, to constrain our space. And so we'd rather that you don't have this law that you're also excited about. So the political will to bring about those kind of legal environments has also been lacking. And even the implementation of the law I earlier referred to, which is the charitable uh, the donations, regulations, has been lacking. So that you will find some of the officials at the Kenya Revenue Authority don't even believe that such an enabling law exists and make it very difficult <coughs> for you to even access those benefits when you yourself know that they exist in the law. 
Um, so lastly, I'll talk about the things that constrain um, uh, the legal environment. Uh, Brian has at least mentioned quite a number of them. We have suffered from copying bad practices. And so we picked up from Egypt and Ethiopia as far as you know, laws that constrain giving. Um, so there was an attempt to actually pass a law that said if you're receiving uh, funding, at least 15% of it um, should be only 15% can be from outside. The rest should be local. And you know that what that would do for local advocacy and human rights organizations. Um, the question of do people do people really understand and support uh, the work that uh, human rights and advocacy organizations do is still a problem. A lot of that is found to be very intangible. Um, but lately we've begun to, we, we are beginning to see how Kenyans can actually um, you know, fundraise around issues to do with public, uh, with, to do with human rights. There was a, a local activist actually, a whistleblower, who very recently, 13 years after this case was instituted in court, uh, received a ruling that you to pay 27 million uh, shillings as a uh, fine and actually for defamation of a public officer. And so there's right now a move to actually mobilize funding around the country where every Kenyan is being asked to leave one shilling because we all felt that that was actually a ruling that will actually close the space for uh, ensuring that um, corruption is dealt to. Um, so in conclude of the of course that Brian talked about the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, which are good laws, but sometimes they can be abused just to um, uh, close the space for some of these organizations and for financing. I thought what I would do today is share with you my experiences of interacting with the high net worth individuals in South Africa because I am part of an organization called the Social Justice Initiative, which was created in 2013 to grow local philanthropy for social justice work. And we had a clear focus from the beginning that we will cultivate the relationships with three types of people. Those who have inherited wealth and continue to grow their wealth, those who started making their wealth or creating their wealth after 1994 or beginning 1994 when we became a democracy and corporate leaders and please note i didn't say corporate i said corporate leaders and our job is not an easy one because we are asking these three groups of people to invest money in social justice causes and we focus our work on benefiting individuals and organizations that seek to shape structural power, <coughs> push public leaders to address injustices and be accountable and enable rights to be accessed especially by the most vulnerable. We also support investigative journalism and you may know the kind of change that investigative journalism has driven in South Africa recently. We support many organizations that were involved in exposing state capture and corruption in South Africa recently. So this is a type of work previously that was supported mainly by foreign donors. And we are saying to the high net worth individuals that we are interacting with that this South African democracy that we achieved through the blood of so many people that they are enjoying today does not count for free. Well, this is really the first time I'm representing a chief and a formal uh, representative for the National Assembly in Nigeria. Honorable Uche Onye Kucha sits as the chairman for the Kisi Trust Fund, which I direct in uh, the Niger Delta. Um, is a fund that is managed by Trust Africa, has a donor advised fund for the benefits of the Ogoni people. Um, I, I, I don't know if 
folks are familiar with the Peace Plus Fund, all the struggles of um, environmental justice uh, or injustice um, in Ogomilan across the Niger Delta. Uh, the Kisi Trust was created or was, was formed over a decade ago uh, from a lawsuit against the nine Ogoni plaintiffs against Shell. So Shell obviously has explored in the Niger Delta. Ogoni was one of the first areas to discover oil in Nigeria. And in 2009, uh, the Wewa versus Shell case, uh, the nine plaintiffs, these were the plaintiffs that were executed by the Abacha government. Um, during this regime, the plaintiffs won the case against Shell. Um, Shell awarded the plaintiffs $15.5 million and has their first philanthropic efforts. They decided to give $5 million of, the, of their, their, their uh, settlement to create the Kisi Trust Fund. And this was over, over a decade ago. But being Niger Delta issues and politics, the trust fund sat um, uh, vacant, there were, there were no activities. We trust fund for a decade until 2017 or 2016 when uh, the trustees then decided that they didn't want to have the responsibilities of managing the fund and so looked for an organization, an African organization that can manage it on their behalf. And that's where Trust Africa and we come in. Um, but Anwar Uche has been part of the fight since, um, like I guess, maybe since the 60s or 70s, um, so he's pretty, pretty familiar about this. Um, talking about Nigeria and its legal framework, on paper, it looks like this is a country that has a lot of legislation, has a lot, is pretty progressive in terms of regulating the space where nonprofits specifically can operate and where uh, incorporated trustees, I think that's a pretty technical problem for charity organizations. Um, however, the, these tax regulations are really poorly enforced and there's a lot of confusion about what it actually means. Um, there's uh, limited enforcement capacity, the tax laws, the governing NGOs and other philanthropic efforts are not clear and um, organizations uh, really are sometimes on a yearly basis un unaware of what the status actually means. Um, two thirds of them don't pay any taxes. They're supposed to. They're supposed to remit uh, annual reports, um, as well as the number of activities on what they've done that year to the government. Um, uh, speaking specifically from the Niger Delta, I can I can confidently say about 90% of them don't do this, um, and so it makes it even difficult for the trust fund working in Ogoni to now in insist on some of this um, requirements to our grantees, knowing that. Everybody else among them don't do it, so why am I going to start asking for annual reports? Why am I going to start asking for audit reports? Why am I going to start asking for activities? Who else they receive money from? What they've done with those funds? Um, and it, it, it causes tension. But I think really thinking about why states in Nigeria are, are hesitant and in some cases resistant to some of some, some of sort of encouraging what is an enabling environment for a, a legal framework that actually works um, has been part of the work that we've been doing um, for some time now. Um, and um, as I've already mentioned, and this is really about ensuring that there's an enabling environment that allows this. Um, and some of the factors have already been discussed. What, what does an enabling environment actually look like? And, and, this, and they include things like strong, democratic, and accountable institutions. We have in the United Delta really weak institutions. This is the one region, for instance, in, in Nigeria that has an entire ministry dedicated to the development of the United Delta region. Um, to this day, I don't know what to do. There's another body called the Niger, Niger, Delta, um, Niger Delta Development Commission that's also ta um, tasked with development for the region and receives billions from the government and from other donors and as well as IOCs operating in the region and across Nigeria. Again, there's, there's very opaque sort of secrecy around what they are supposed to actually do. Um, so in terms of accountable uh, institutions, we don't really have anybody or any sort of agencies that can, can hold um, this sector together. Um, good governance that also includes political, administrative, fiscal, decentralization policies, 
that all come together. All of that is absent and missing. Sound economic policies and progressive tax schemes, appropriate social and um, productive infrastructure. Um, and then the last one is really stronger partnerships between um, high network individuals, governments, and the private sector. Um, so in terms of like my background specifically before I came to work for Trust Africa, I was part of an organization that did, did advocacy um, across the Niger Delta region and now also in the Northeast as well, um, that tried to get governments to really think about how they plan for the future. Um, it's a really sad state in Niger Delta that planning and, and this conversation about legal frameworks um, and its mechanics and it's really about how we plan and what we think about what the future is going to look like. In the Niger Delta, there's an absence of sort of planning. Yeah, this is the region that has the most plans on paper, stored somewhere, um, for the region for the development. And again, this is the region that produces over 80% of the country's GDP, right? It's, it's one of the most um, devastating in terms of, of um, livelihood issues um, for, for its citizens. Um, and so I've, I've tried, I've, I've worked with the United States government in, in trying to encourage them to start thinking about what tax incentives mean, um, encouraging investors to come into the region, um, in, in, encourage them to think about everything from education to healthcare to livelihood issues to unemployment issues. Um, and there's a sense of, I think the biggest struggle there was sort of ch um, changing mindset. Um, attitudes towards tax incentives or really towards the uh, society sector. Um, they receive the 13% federal allocation regardless of whether they do anything or not. And so that has caused them to not be as progressive or as forward thinking about tax issues um, and just rely on the revenue that comes from the oil. And I think that's the biggest challenge um, that 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 region has to face is that because of the, the oil curse is a serious um, issue in terms of being progressive and thinking about other things. I wonder to what extent you have examples of specific good practices or policies which one can share and encourage other countries to pick up. My mind goes to Mauritius, who developed, um, as part of their tax um, system, a levy on corporate social responsibility. So that corporations, as part of the corporation tax, I can't remember the percentage, but part of it is, does not go to the treasury. It goes to an independent fund for corporate social responsibility. The last time I studied it was 2012, and in that year, there was, there was more money than projects to fund. So civil society would go to that fund, which seemed to me a neat idea, an easy one to do, but it hasn't had a lot of take up elsewhere. But other examples would be very helpful. Uh, my question is directed to Sister Marcel Hall. Right. My question, Sister, your organization, Southern Africa Trust, I think four years back, you were on records, you went public, announcing that you for something like five billion rands, which is for the ex-miners living or dead. Some are in inside the countries in South Africa, some are in neighboring countries, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, the suit and so forth. Uh, my sister, can you please share with us, have you uh, ditched even a single cent to me when I was including myself? <laughs> Great privilege to have such insight into all of your uh, experiences, regulation, policy. My question is to Faith about Kenya. From what you outlined, you've really developed fantastic uh, internal regulation and tax arrangements for Kenyans. Um, what I'm interested in, has the corollary of that been greater constraint and regulation on international NGO 
opera operations in Kenya? No, um, uh, uh, jokes aside, I won't be able to give you um, the figures per se, and, and maybe I'll ask my, my colleague uh, Nalo uh, to step in here. But I think uh, you touch on a very important point, which is really around um, uh, uh, you know, putting in place legal frameworks that make it easy for us to uh, uh, you know, move across uh, benefits from social protection, which are a reflection of the nature of uh, labor migration practices, right? Um, and, and you're talking about uh, the benefits that accrue to ex-miners who were working in South Africa but have since gone back home and they were not able to access their resources from uh, the insurance companies, from the health insurance benefits and so forth. We have been able to work with the South African government, with the banks, with the insurance companies here, um, to move some of the resources back. But what we have been able to do as well is to help ex-miners associations form an, uh, 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 the, the ex form an association that actually gives them the political capital and force to be able to claim their rights. The Southern African Miners Association, and I will give you contacts after this, um, beyond the regional body, we've also been able to set up national charters in the countries um, where the migrant labors were originating from. The Sutu has a very strong association. Swaziland has a very strong association, and I think the chair of the Swaziland Association is also the chair of the, re of the regional association. Mozambique has set up an association, and Botswana has set up an association. And what those associations have been able to do again is resolve a problem that um, insurance companies were, were claiming was the blockage for them distributing that money. They were claiming they could not trace the beneficiaries. And the associations have been able to attract the beneficiaries and put them in touch um, with, the, with the insurance companies. But it didn't stop there. There is a conversation that is happening within the study level around um, harmonizing our social protection legislation, which will then eliminate this problem of South Africa sitting with the wealth and the money for the rest of the region and simply not distributing it. So I think there's, there's, there's a possibility of resolving that in the long term. Um, a question from my brother there was um, uh, examples of um, good policies. Um, South African colleagues might not agree with this, but when I actually look at the region as a whole, I think that South Africa has developed very robust corporate social responsibility <coughs> policies that make it possible to tap into money that sits in the private sector towards um, giving for good. Um, but we don't see that kind of legislation um, uh, throughout the rest of the region. And where it becomes problematic is really around the role that South African capital plays in the rest of the region. There's an expansion of South African companies moving out of it, particularly in the retail industry. The shop right is everywhere. Um, you look at the insurance companies, all mutual has got offices everywhere, uh, telecom industry, and so forth. But that expansion into the rest of the region and the continent is not taken with the good practices from the corporate social responsibility simply because it's not a legal requirement in the other countries. So again, we have started a conversation at a regional level with regional governments to say um, how do we uh, come up with uh, uh, corporate social responsibility as a legislative framework at a regional level which would make it almost mandatory for governments to, to um, to implement. And then lastly, and I think I'm really encouraged by what is happening in the space of financial inclusion. And uh, we have seen the remittance corridors that I was talking about. The Sotu is one, but there's remittance corridors between Malawi and uh, South Africa, between uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe, South Africa and Mozambique. And when you pay attention, they're actually uh, following um, the routes, the trade routes that cross border traders, informal cross border traders are using. And it is a result of their own advocacy, but it is also the uh, banking sector realizing that the bulk of the money is moving through these informal channels. So they're also looking to cash in. Um, but it does work out for everyone when that money is moved um, in cost effective. I agree with Masipo that we do have good, very good complex social responsibility regulation in South Africa. The only problem is the execution um, and where that money goes. It mainly goes to education and to social welfare issues. Only 1% of that goes to social justice issues. And 
the real issues of African realism on social injustices that were created in the past, that still continue today, that need to be addressed head on. Uh, most social justice organizations don't even know where to begin to access that money. It is a, uh, not an easy journey, uh, yet they have a responsibility to disclose those funds. But again, they are going mainly to education. There's just an overinvestment in formal education. I'm not saying we don't need it, we do need it. I'm a bit uncomfortable, and I've been for the last two days just listening to all of you, but Becky, I think, knows my discomfort. The bigger question we must answer, and I think Adam Habib started talking about it, is what is the accumulated wisdom about African development and Africa's socioeconomic transformation? And how does this thing we're calling philanthropy, and Masako began to speak to some of it, fit into that vision of socioeconomic structural transformation? And, and, and it is, we have a specific experience with certain orthodoxies, including the ones that were pushed by the bank and the fund in the 80s. And sometimes listening to our discussion of philanthropy sounds like we're going back to that, that the only thing that was wrong, you had a group of corrupt African politicians, otherwise the economic prescriptions were good, they would have turned all of us into billionaires and millionaires. That is not true, we all know this. The reason why our approach should be different, Dr. Moyne, is our societies are fundamentally different from other societies where philanthropy has been happening in terms of structure, in terms of demographics, in terms of our social support, social inclusion, social interaction system. And therefore, and I, I was going to say my, my system, uh, the reason why high net worth individuals have no, are not affected by laws in most of our countries is we are largely banana republics. Elsewhere they are. The most concerned people, the weakness of the state, the predatory nature of capital, the financialization of development, and now the danger of the financialization of philanthropy is painting us into a corner where if, and there's something implied in Prince question, where if we don't manage that, and that's why I said, let's reflect on what international NGOs did. They've been in this continent since the 1960s. They have thrown a lot of money, built a lot of schools, built a lot of hospitals. In fact, I want to challenge all of you to read the report that we did for Southern Africa Trust. African governments went wholesale, hook, line, and sinker onto, let's develop, develop micro-enterprise, micro-finance. They did all that. We still didn't do the poverty exit. Mm -hmm. So I'm uncomfortable if we sit and talk as though there's something new with doing fundamentally without, if we dehistoricize our experience with charity, then we make that history the present, and the present the past. So I want to suggest to our colleagues that if governing the ecosystem of philanthropy, Dr. Moore, is about talking about the diversity of what we're calling philanthropy. So for example, venture capital, uh, impact investing, and then we have the SACOs, the then we have high net worth individuals with sugar ladies and sugar ladies with money. Then we have, we have such a diversity that governing this ecosystem is much more than passing rules that enable the ecosystem to operate. It is actually looking at how operations in one sphere can undermine the aspiration in another sphere. Because Becky is getting, um, I, I several, and accountability. The one thing fundamentally that has not happened, and thank God for the Zimbabweans asking for all those complex questions, is that high net worth individuals and big foundations hardly ever have the accountability uh, question that we're talking about. The few governments that make the silly decision of PNG end up all in the same space. So the question of sovereignty, not just of an abstraction called the state, but sovereign of us as a people, sovereign of our own systems of knowledge and giving. And how a flood of money 
intended to help can actually decapitate the ability of people to have indigenous forms of transformation. And then I want to end on the issue of um, of of, uh, of, um, of of naming and qualification. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you constrained me before. I, uh, yes, I have 30 seconds, right? Yeah, 30 seconds, yeah. You know, I talked about that critical man. I thought I was talking about that. No, but uh, sorry, Dr. Man, I've been telling myself, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to let that. <laughs> because <laughs> because he interrupted the flow of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that. There is a beautiful book written in 2001 called Regulation as Emancipation that begins to question the notion that regulation in and of itself will create a culture, a psyche, a predisposition, and a power. In societies where informal power is more powerful than formal power. So the point I wanted to make is that if we're talking about regulation, we will have to go beyond the law and talk about, I like what you say, take society as it is. Appreciate why when you have youth funds, very few South African youths are making an effort to access those funds. It's not because they don't want the money. It's because they don't see money as the solution. And this conception of aspiration, that the aspiration of every poor person is to become as capitalist and poor belly as myself, isn't for long. <laughs> I think that you do have poor people, you do have people who are not poor, whose aspiration is different. The diversity of aspiration regarding our humanity should be the centerpiece of philanthropy. And philanthropy needs to exit Dr. Moyo from an obsessive, obsessive focus on poverty to a focus on humanity, on solidarity and transformation. So, okay, so please join me in thanking uh, the panel uh, for keeping us awake.